It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Jessica Nielsen. The title of her talk is Ayahuasca for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, Assessing Risks and Benefits Through Anonymous Community Feedback. Jessica is a research faculty at the University of California, San Francisco, specializing in neurotrauma basic and clinical research. So she's uh, involved in both this project that she will present here about ayahuasca and PTSD, and uh, the first steps of thinking a clinical trial with ayahuasca in the USA. Please welcome Jessica. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and thank you for that lovely introduction, Bia. Um, so, let's see. So I'm just gonna give you a brief background or overview of what I'm gonna talk to you about today. Um, first, I'm gonna start with uh, how I got involved in ayahuasca research and a little bit of my background. Uh, next, I'm gonna follow up with how ayahuasca could be a potentially an effective treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Next, I'll show you some preliminary results from an anonymous online survey I've been conducting since uh, June of last year, um, trying to look at the risks and benefits um, of ayahuasca for PTSD. Uh, and then I'll close out with what the next steps are in terms of conducting ayahuasca, ayahuasca research therapy in the United States. So how did I get involved in ayahuasca research? So when I was in graduate school getting my PhD in neurobiology and trauma, um, I attended a lecture by MAPS at uh, the Burning Man Festival, and I was astounded at the fact that researching psychedelics could be a valid career option for me, and that that's, there was a potential option for me to push my, my research forward. Um, and so fast forward, when I actually finished my PhD in 2010, I went down to Peru to take ayahuasca, and I happened to be at a center that was um, focused on treating veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And the main thing I took away from that trip was seeing and witnessing the transformation of these people with pretty severe PTSD and the healing that they went through um, from their ayahuasca experiences. And so I came back to the United States to start um, to continue my trauma research and then um, see how I could fold ayahuasca into that research. So how potentially could ayahuasca be effective for post-traumatic stress disorder? So first, let me walk you through sort of what PTSD is and sort of the central hypothesis of, of how things can be adapted um, after a traumatic experience and how we can heal from that. So PTSD is essentially maladaptive coping to a traumatic event. So it's normal to have strong reactions to life-threatening situations. Normal adults will have a decrease in these reactions when the threat is no longer present. PTSD patients, on the other hand, have a persistent reaction even when the threat is gone, and that's usually because they develop unhealthy coping mechanisms that exacerbate psychopathology. And so what does that actually mean in terms of the trajectory of how people respond to trauma and how PTSD develops? So there's a whole host of factors that we can't necessarily control for that are sort of pre-traumatic that I sort of have highlighted up here. Um, and these are things like your genetic history, things that you're exposed to in the womb or as a child, um, family medical history, socioeconomic status, things like that. And all of these feed into how you're going to actually respond when you're exposed to a traumatic event. And then these are the different trajectories that sometimes happen after a traumatic event. Um, and so normal people, like I said, will have this initial fight or flight response when exposed to a trauma, but they'll have re resiliency and normal adaptation, and then they won't develop PTSD. Some people that do develop PTSD symptoms, um, if they have access to beneficial treatments and adequate social support, um, will eventually recover from their PTSD. When persistent PTSD happens, it's when there's a maladaptive coping that happens in people where they will either start developing things like drug addiction or negative and avoidant behaviors that will then exacerbate the psychopathology and these symptoms will persist and then there's this treatment resistance that sets in. Lastly, there's this thing called complex PTSD, which is a little hard to sort of unpack and, and, and treat and manage because it's when somebody is continually living in, in a situation that is ongoing and traumatic, whether it's a, a domestic abuse situation or they live in a violent urban area or an active war zone. And so they're continually being traumatized over and over again. And so it's really hard to get in and treat that when the trauma continues. Um, and so the, what's happening in the brain and the body when um, PTSD is sort of setting in and developing, um, it involves several systems in the brain and the body. So this includes the HPA axis and the limbic system. The limbic system is basically the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, and the amygdala, which is involved in emotion. 
And these systems sort of um, communicate with each other where a memory will trigger an emotion. And sometimes those emotions will cause a reaction in your HPA axis, which is sort of your fight or flight response. This is your sort of response to trauma where you release adrenaline. But the system is set up in such a way that it can auto-regulate itself. So if you release a, a massive amount of adrenaline, it will turn this whole system off. And then you also have the prefrontal cortex coming into play where If there is something that is an emotional reaction, you can have this in top-down inhibition that can sort of let the body know the, the trauma is not significant, um, and then it will regulate this whole system and turn this off. However, when you have PTSD and you have various either psychogenic stressors or physiological stressors, then what happens is that there is sort of an overexpression and a hyperactivity of this adrenaline response, this fight-or-flight response that sort of makes this circuitry very, very hyperactivated, and it causes a disinhibition and a dysregulation of this, this um, top-down control um, that can actually cause significant psychopathology and actual physical pathology in the hippocampus. Patients with PTSD have um, significantly um, atrophied hippocampi, um, and so that's a big problem in terms of just brain pathology with PTSD. The good thing is that there are some therapies that work um, if administered correctly. Um, and so we have things like SSRIs, like antidepressants, which act to sort of reduce this activity in the amygdala is also, and also try to increase activity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has also shown some promise. And then there's also, um, oh, so that when you have these, these therapies that come into play, that when you have these stressors that come in, Um, you are able to sort of reestablish normal control and have normal adaptation when you feel triggered. Um, exposure therapy is another one of these things, and this is where I think ayahuasca comes into play. Um, so ayahuasca sort of has mechanisms in exposure therapy where exposure therapy is basically activating this access, and, um, but doing it so in a situation that's safe so that people can try and recontextualize the way they're responding to the trauma. Um, but it also acts like a you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and, as well as the SSRI. So it's kind of got all of these components in it, but this is something that we need to be mindful of in terms of people with PTSD because exposure therapy, if not done in the right setting and not done in a place where people really have um, a process in place to sort of feel support so that they, they don't um, get re-exposed to this trauma in an unsafe setting um, can actually be re-traumatizing if not done correctly. So we really need to be mindful of this, especially in the context of ayahuasca for PTSD. Um, but even still, there's a lot of um, studies coming out for various um, therapeutic potentials of ayahuasca for various other disorders that um, go hand in hand with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so there's been some publications showing indications for drug addiction as well as depression, um, which are often comorbid with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so a couple years ago, um, I had a sample size of, of three veterans that had shared experience reports with me, um, basically saying that their ayahuasca experience down in Peru was very um, therapeutic, and um, they were really viewing this as a medicine for their PTSD, but it was obviously, you know, an N of three. It was a very small sample size and mostly anecdotal. Um, looking at sort of more user-reported experiences up on the internet, I looked at Arrowwood, which is this great online database I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, where there's a lot of these experience reports specifically about ayahuasca that are categorized based on, you know, how they would view the experience. And so I just want to highlight that although most people are saying that the, the experience is very difficult and challenging, um, they don't necessarily consi consider them bad experiences, but they do consider them to be mystical and glowing experiences, which is um, encouraging. Um, so, because this is kind of all the data that was out at the time and because I've actually been spending the past six years thinking about how to push ayahuasca research forward in the United States, and it's obviously not without its challenges and limitations and, and whatnot in terms of regulatory agencies and the stigma, um, I decided to conduct an online survey because over the past couple of years, ayahuasca for PTSD is becoming quite popularized. There's a lot of stories out there about people thinking that ayahuasca is this magic bullet cure for PTSD. Um, and there's actually been a lot of good and bad press about this. And so I thought there's enough people out there that have already tried this for their PTSD. Let's see if we can get them to answer some questions about their experience and whether they actually found it useful and report on any potential risks and dangers as also benefits, the things that help them move through if the, PT if the ayahuasca was helpful for their PTSD. Okay, so this is in collaboration with MAP. So this is an online survey. It's anonymous. It's actually still ongoing. If you want to um, contribute to the survey, the link is here. Um, and so this is an anonymous survey 
questionnaire to gather preliminary data about the potential risks and benefits associated with taking ayahuasca, specifically in the context of treating PTSD, but I also invited people um, that didn't have PTSD to take the survey. So just to start off with some of the study limitations, obviously this is an anonymous survey. We're not contacting anybody directly, so we can't really sort of engage with these people and really get a sense of what's going on with them um, on a personal basis, um, like you would do in a, in a prospective study where you're interviewing people. It's retrospective, so we're asking people to sort of remember what had happened to them after they took ayahuasca, um, instead of actually being able to follow them longitudinally and sort of intervene and, and um, assess the process as it's happening. And then also there's quite a lot of variability in set and setting, so we just kind of took all comers, whether people were taking it in Peru or taking it in the United States or Europe. Um, so just keep that in mind moving forward with the results. So this is just the study design in terms of what data actually was included in um, the analyses I'm going to show you moving forward. Um, so as of April 12th of this month, um, 714 people attempted to take the survey, um, but a little less than half of that actually completed it all the way, um, and so that was part of the consent, was they had to complete the survey in order for the data to be included. Um, and then I had an additional option at the end of whether people didn't feel comfortable having their data included, and so I gave them an option to withdraw consent at the end. So by the end of all this, we have 318 people that have shared their ayahuasca experiences um, in this anonymous survey, and whether it was beneficial or harmful for their post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so there's some of the measures that, and some of the questions I asked in the survey. It was quite a long survey, but I wanted to be very um, thorough and descriptive about the um, potential risks and benefits of ayahuasca for PTSD. Um, so I had things like demographics, like age, gender, um, education level, things like that. Um, I had quite a lot of questions about the ayahuasca experience itself, how they would rate the ayahuasca experience, what set and setting they were in, what things they found to be dangerous or helpful. And then I had a lot of different questions that were associated with PTSD itself. So I had them answer questions about changes in their PTSD symptoms, if they had any, substance abuse changes, any treatments that they had been on before and how that changed after taking ayahuasca, um, any integration techniques that they used once they were finished taking ayahuasca, their perceived levels of social support, um, and uh, an inventory that's supposed to assess resiliency and growth after a traumatic event. Um, as well as a self-report of PTSD symptoms, depression, and sleep quality. So these are just some of the descriptives of, um, of the data from some of the completed participants that I broke down based on one of the PTSD questions was, have you ever been diagnosed by a clinician as having sort of DSM criteria PTSD? And so it was about 50-50 of people that said no, they'd never been diagnosed with PTSD, and then people that either had a current diagnosis of PTSD or claimed to have been in remission since taking ayahuasca. And so, um, just as a sort of sanity check, we do have this sort of range. This is the, the self-report measure of PTSD that I told you about, where the people that claim to have a current diagnosis of PTSD have significantly higher scores on this measure, um, whereas those that claim to be in remission are much lower, and uh, the people that have no PTSD are also much lower than that, which is good. Um, and also, just like I said, depression is a highly comorbid condition with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so the patients that were, or the participants that reported having a current diagnosis of PTSD did have higher levels of depression than the the other two groups. Okay. Um, and just getting into sort of the distribution of some of the information of who these people are and where they were taking ayahuasca and in what context. So most of the participants were civilians. Um, the color codes here, I just broken it up by those three groups I told you about, um, whether they had no PTSD, a past diagnosis of PTSD, or were currently um, diagnosed with PTSD. So like I said, most people were um, civilians that participated the survey, and most people had done ayahuasca 10 or more times, um, so this was sort of like an arbitrary number. I didn't want to have a bunch of these categories for the numbers. Um, so 10 was the cutoff, but there was people that had taken it up to 300 times. Um, so it seems like once people reach this threshold, they're doing it very consistently and very often. Um, uh, people were taking it in various settings, so we have a lot of people taking it in South American retreat centers, um, not too many taking them in South American churches, but a lot of people taking them in the United States, um, as well as outside of the Americas. And then there's this sort of other category where it was just open text responses, where um, people were um, saying that they didn't take ayahuasca, but they took DMT, or they were taking it um, at home by themselves, there was actually quite a bit of that, or in a friend circle. Um, people taking it one-on-one -on -one with a shaman or some other indigenous community that wasn't part of the, the um, 
South American retreat setting, as well as places in Europe and Canada. Um, so this is um, a distribution of that measure I was telling you about that's a, a, a test of growth and resiliency following a life-altering event. Um, and so this assesses various things like relating to others, new possibilities, personal strength. And so it's sort of like a positive measure of how people can adapt following a very intense situation. And so I asked them to answer these questions in relation to their ayahuasca experience, because there are some people that report ayahuasca itself to be a very traumatizing experience if not done correctly. Um, so I wanted to see how people were responding to that, especially people with PTSD. Um, and so a lower score on this measure means they were less able to do these, these, um, these have these beneficial responses. Um, the good news is that the people that, had, that were claiming to be in remission after taking PTSD were scoring pretty well compared to the people that had never been diagnosed with PTSD. But we do see that the people that had a current diagnosis of PTSD were performing um, much lower on this measure of resiliency and growth after ayahuasca. Uh, getting into the actual symptoms, um, so there was six different questions of symptoms that I had them answer on whether one week after taking ayahuasca, how do they remember their symptoms changing? Were they getting better or were they getting worse or not changing at all? Um, and so this includes things like re-experiencing and avoidance, negative thoughts, as well as depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, and so for the most part, people are saying that they have um, reductions and, and they're having improvements in all of these symptoms across the board one week after taking ayahuasca. And this is maintained um, one month after taking ayahuasca. There was this slight uptick here in the hyperarousal state, which if you remember, I said that ayahuasca is kind of like an exposure therapy, so it can induce this sort of activated state. Um, but by one month, they report that that was no longer an issue. In terms of substance use changes, um, we also do see some, some beneficial changes here where people are reporting much less use of alcohol and prescription drug use. The one interesting thing that I noted was that people were reporting taking more psychedelics um, and more marijuana. Um, but when looking at sort of the free text of these responses, it's not necessarily that they're becoming addicted to psychedelics. Um, it's that they're using it as an integration strategy and as a way to sort of continually work on their own healing and growth after they sort of worked with this expanded state and discovered that it was something that they wanted to, um, that was very useful for them. Um, regarding changes in medications that people were taking before and after um, their ayahuasca experience, um, so I broke this up into people with um, no diagnosis of PTSD versus those that had a past or current diagnosis of PTSD. And then the red bars indicate um, what they were on before, how many were on, saying they were on this category before ayahuasca, and then blue is, um, the reduction seen after. And so you can see just for the most part, the people on it that had PTSD were obviously on a lot more therapies and medications. Um, and you do see a marked decrease in all of these like antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicines after taking ayahuasca. Um, and then there's just a sort of other category of well, what else are people using. So people, a lot of people were smoking marijuana beforehand, not necessarily medical marijuana. And then a lot of people just doing medication, uh, meditation and yoga and things like that. Um, but there were a lot of people just after ayahuasca just saying nothing. I needed nothing. I was great. Everything is so much better now. And so that was encouraging. Um, regarding different integration techniques, these are just sort of word frequency um, categories. There was sort of a categories of different things where I said, did you try meditation, yes or no? Did you try yoga, yes or no? So that's what this top sort of word cloud represents where most people were using meditation as a way to kind of integrate and process their experience. And then there was a free text section where I said, just tell me what's your own strategy for integration after taking ayahuasca. Um, and a lot of people were reporting that they were just doing exercise, getting out in nature, dancing, writing about their experience. I mean, they were just basically things about people, you know, trying to engage in healthy lifestyle choices and eating better and, and connecting with their friends and, and really getting out of these sort of unhealthy, negative, maladaptive mechanisms that they had before. Um, uh, so getting into sort of like the purpose of what this whole survey was about was sort of looking at the, the risks and the benefits and um, how is that different in the people that have PTSD versus don't have PTSD who are in remission. And so I asked them, did you find anything about the ayahuasca experience helpful or dangerous, um, either during or after? Um, and so for the most part, during and after um, the ayahuasca experience, people report that most of the time there was a lot of helpful things that, that were beneficial um, in their journey, um, with some people sort of seeing this increase with um, the diagnosis of PTSD that, that oh crap, sorry. <laughs> Uh, that 
yeah, as 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 um as you go sort of deeper into whether they have PTSD or not, you do sort of see this increase in people not necessarily thinking it was that helpful, but for the most part, people finding it to be very helpful. Um, in terms of what they found to be dangerous, um, again, you do see that for the most part, people don't think that there's a whole lot of danger associated with taking ayahuasca, but there is some instances of people reporting that there were some dangerous aspects both during and after. Um, and so just to kind of get into some qualitative information about this, I want to um, read to you some representative examples of um, what people were reporting as being dangerous. So I'm going to start off with dangerous because um, I think it's something that's important to address. Um, that this isn't a panacea, and there are some risks associated with this. So the first is someone who still had a current diagnosis of PTSD that found that there was some danger during their experience. So he said, not having a psychotherapist available to help me deal with the absolute paranoia I experienced. I have a history of intense trauma from childhood. My experience took me to the edge of the terror in my childhood, but did not take me past it to heal it. I became overcome with the terror I had as a child, so I became a child and went into my cabin and locked myself in it, feeling like I did when I was 10 years old. And so this was someone who sort of felt that, you know, a lot of things came up and they didn't really know what to do with it or process it and didn't really feel that they were able to resolve it. Um, next was somebody who actually wasn't prepared to deal with all of the stuff that came up and fell into a three-month-long depression and almost had to drop out of college after taking ayahuasca because they went home and just didn't know how to kind of integrate that into their life and actually it was um, really problematic for her. Um, but for the most part, like that's just a small example of some of these dangers, but for the most part, these responses are very positive and beneficial and people really do find that this is useful for their PTSD. Um, and so here's some examples. Um, so one was uh, childhood trauma and sexual abuse I had no memory of came up in my second ceremony. It all made sense in the way I had lived my life. Severely depressed and a functioning alcoholic, I went to Peru out of desperation. The first ceremony, my depression was gone. I've done 15 ceremonies and it has changed my life. I'm no longer an alcoholic and I am working on not being isolated. I now engage in group meditations five days a week and I'm practicing yoga and Qigong. It's never too late to wake up and that's what this loving plant has taught me. Another person wrote, it took me straight to the root of some childhood trauma of mine that involved sexual interference. Without bringing the memory up in visual forms, the memory took on a different form altogether that was hard to explain, but I knew what my psyche was getting at. And so, for the most part, this seems to be, to be useful, and so the, people are finding that this is a very helpful and positive experience when they take ayahuasca. It is very intense, and there is a lot of bodily discomfort, but for the most part, people don't find it dangerous, and they find it to be very helpful for their PTSD. Um, and so just moving forward with um, how we're going to implement ayahuasca research in the United States moving forward, I'm working in collaboration with MAPS to develop an FDA protocol um, for a phase one study to start um, looking at ayahuasca and healthy volunteers. This is going to be a um, dose escalation pharmacokinetic tolerability and safety study to start. And then once we figure out the optimal doses and responses, um, we're going to move on to PTSD patients. And so we're hoping to submit this in the next couple months. Um, and we're really hoping that you know, we can start fundraising for this and um, move this forward in, in the proper clinical trial um, format. And um, we're hoping to start doing some fundraising at some point. And this was in collaboration, again, like I said, with MAPS. And this is our whole ayahuasca working group of all of us sort of having regular calls to develop the protocol for ayahuasca in the United States. Um, Clancy Kavnar and Julie Megler are going to be part of our co-therapy team. And then also Ali Fiducia at MAPS, who's been a great um, help in helping me develop the protocol. And also just want to invite you all to an event we're hosting on Tuesday um, with some of the, the speakers that we have here from Brazil, um, as well as, as, as nationally, to sort of talk about the logistics of doing these studies in the United States. Thank you.